This is Red Inca. During the 1980s, there was a bowler you noticed. He was fast and furious well before the franchise. Patrick Patterson had a gap in his teeth and a huge front foot pointed at your throat. And then, not long after that, he just disappeared until one man found him. My name is Bharat Sundaresan. I am the Australian correspondent for Crick Bus, number one cricket website of the world. Sadly, there's many stories of West Indian cricketers who disappear. They're household names, and then almost as fast as they bowl, they just disappear and become no ones again. But perhaps there's not been another cricketer who's been as well known who vanished quite like Patterson. So I got Barrett on to discuss his 2017 piece on how he found this lost legend. First question, mate, is how old were you when Patrick Patterson last played a test? <laughs> That's a very good question to start with, because I was very, very young. I was seven, I think, when I saw him for the first and only time on TV. And the only reason I really, really remember him is like, yeah, he was fast and nasty. And I used to hear my older brother, who was my cricket guru growing up, tell me a lot about him. And also, he used to get me to do all these bowling actions, like replicate them at home. And whenever it was Patrick Patterson, like my brother would say, oh, he always wore a headband. And obviously, we didn't have headbands at home. <laughs> and not because we were poor, but like, why should a seven-year-old have a headband anyway? <laughs> so he would actually, my brother would get one of his waist belts and like put it around my forehead. And it would really hurt because the bloody buckle would go into my forehead. And then I had to like yeah, pull off the Patrick Patterson action. So one of the main reasons he stuck in my head was because of that pain in my forehead. <laughs> It's really interesting because when did he finish? 91, 92. So I was 11 or 12 when he played his last test. I'm a couple of years older than you. And I kind of remember vague things like commentators talking about how fast he was and, you know, him occasionally hitting a batsman. But it's not like someone like Colin Croft who went on to become a commentator or Barry Richards who sort of hung around. All I really have is Ro Belinda's YouTube page occasionally and some old memories, and yet he's this cricketer that I think for many people stuck in our minds. Do you think it could have something to do with his name? Because like Patrick Patterson just has a good ring to it, right? Like, it has a ring of someone who's important. There have been so many other West Indian fast bowlers who, like, you know, for example, Franklin Rose maybe played the same number of test matches, but, you know, just just doesn't stand out. But Patrick Patterson, just the name, I, I think it was... It was an easy name to learn for a young Indian, like growing up in Bombay. Like, you know, it wasn't very complicated. It wasn't Vince Vanderbile or something like that, or Hansi Kronji. So, like, you know, I think that had a lot to do with names and sports people. Think about it, Jared. Like, I think mm. there is a connection there. No, no, I think you're right. And also, it's alliterative as well. Like, and it's got the double P's and a double T. So, I think there's a lot to that. I also think that just on a basic level, that we know so much about almost every other legendary West Indies bowler that there has to be a magical sort of background guy as well. Like, you know, Kurtley, he was mysterious when he played, but then he went on to become a musician and do commentary and release a book. And, you know, Colin Croft became a commentator occasionally and appeared in things. And, Andy Roberts still gets trotted out when you're doing the best bowlers and Malcolm Marshall became a legend. Everyone sort of had a thing and Patrick Patterson was the one that a lot of us remembered but doesn't really have anything other than the fact that he was really quick and had this incredible front foot. Seriously. And the thing is, the first time I went to the Caribbean in 2011 and like, you know, his name was always in my head. And when I asked about him, like the one thing I heard from a lot of people was, I am last in the bush, man, I'm last in the bush. But like, you know, which is a very common expression in Jamaica, which generally means like someone's lost, like, you know, he's gone, he's in the bush. But like, there were others, like, you know, a lot of those who went on those rebel tours who came back. Mm. Richard Austin, I remember, he wasn't in the greatest state of mind. He used to run around Sabina Park, like, you know, saying things, acting a little, like, you know, out of it. But, like, there was no proof to the fact that Patrick Patterson was lost. Like, you know, there was a documentary on those guys who went on the Rebel Tours and were lost. Mm. And, like, you know, Winston Benjamin, again, like, you know, played in the same era. I, I remember meeting him, doing a story on him. He puts up boundary boards at the new Antigua Sir Vivian Richards Stadium. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, he says, oh, like, an honest pay for an honest day's work. Like, you know, it's not something that you expect a former cricketer to do. But there was no proof of what happened to Patrick Patterson, which I guess was what intrigued me to start with. And so you've got the headband. 
And now you've got your journalistic sort of spidey senses have been pricked a little bit. How long did it take you to find him? Because I've just started doing a piece on a West Indian cricketer who's also gone missing. I won't mention it because I don't want you to steal my article. But but <laughs> they are very hard to find. You hear a lot of rumours. In fact, that was one thing that from your article that really reminded me of my current chase is you hear a lot of people go, oh, he's gone. And so, well, what does that mean? And <laughs> where is he gone? And is he in the bush? And all these sorts of things. And so much talk about loony asylums. I'm like, I don't think there's that many loony asylums in the whole Caribbean. I could literally just go to them and find them if he was there. Exactly, right? And if he was a cricketer, everybody would know. And that's mm. the whole irony. Like, though cricket is not as popular as everybody makes it to be right now, that is, but people know their cricketers there. And like, you know, if there was a cricketer in a loony asylum, people would know, right? Like, you know, and <laughs> that's the thing. And to answer your question, like the first time I went there, I got no trace and found no trace. So the second time I went there, and this is like when um, my wife came along with me to the Caribbean and I, I told her, I mean, this is where I originally come from. Because you know my connections to the Caribbean, Jared. Like, you know, it's very deeply ingrained. And yeah, I mean, she just rolled her eyes at me. But anyway, so when we were there, it was just a tri-series, India, Sri Lanka, West Indies, a two-leg one. The first leg was in Jamaica and the second leg was in Trinidad. And there was like a gap in between. So my poor wife all she had done in jamaica was like walk the streets of kingston trying to find chris gale's house with me like you know in the proper the ghetto area not where you should be taking your wife on a technically your honeymoon come work trip but anyway well i mean let's just stop there for a minute because it's quite interesting kingston is not the safest place on earth in fact it would be the very opposite of the safest place (laughs) on earth at times i mean i don't get spooked in cities i love walking around cities all around the world it's an interesting place to go looking for a cricketer to begin with, isn't it? It really is. Because like, you know how it works there, right? A lot of them start in the lesser privileged parts of the city. And when they get rich, they go on to the ill, as they say. Like, you know, it's either Strawberry Hill or the other hill. And then like Chris Gale, for example, has this massive house on the hill where the first thing he does apparently every morning is go to the balcony and like, you know, looks at Kingston, where he came from. Marlon Samuels has a house which is on the same hill, but at a higher level for obvious reasons. So hmm. once you are famous or once you have some money, you are in like the proper posh parts of Kingston. And if you're not, then you have to step into some really not so nice areas or not so friendly areas to find anyone. And that's what I did. And like once the Jamaica leg like, got over, there were like two days, like I said, and I thought like she should see some like decent parts of the country. So we decided to like do this road trip to the north of the country where they have the nice fancy beaches. But the route I chose, like which I didn't tell her, was through Patrick Patterson's hometown, like which was mm-hmm. like say like a halfway point between Kingston and, and where we were going. And because I'd found out that his parents were still there. And I was like, well, I mean, if someone goes missing for lo- so long, no trace of him. Either he's with them or at least they'll know where he is, right? But our first task was to find his parents. So we did this road trip and every like, you know, hour or so you stopped on the side of the road, bought yourself a red stripe because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, drinking and driving, eh, they're pretty easy about it, as you know, Jared. (laughs) And once I was in that district, I started asking people at every rest stop, really asking them if they had heard of him, if they knew where he was. And nobody knew till like I reached a point where this guy walked into the store right after me and I was asking the storekeeper about Patrick Patterson maybe the seventh time that afternoon and this guy said oh like what name did he say I said like I mean I'm man and my eyes just lit up and I was like wow and he's like yeah him him parents just live down the road man come come that's it like you know (laughs) I've done it it was that easy so like it just took a road trip with the wife like you know to North Jamaica and then I go like you know he leads me to his parents house and his parents are there they're obviously pretty old and then I started asking them about Patrick and they had no idea where he was. And I was like, what? His mother stood like, you know, on the veranda and she's like, yeah, Patrick's a nice boy. He's a nice boy. He's not done anything wrong. People say a lot of things. And then I was like, so when did you last see him? Like, ah, it's been many years. We don't know where he is, but he's a nice boy. And like, you know, hmm. and yeah, I tried my level best to get something out of them. Then you could make out that it wasn't like they were hiding anything. They really did not know. I wrote a piece then saying like, you know, how he, this guy's lost and even his parents don't know where he is and like, it didn't go viral, but like, yeah, people like the story, I guess. And, and again, like, you know, and then we went to North Jamaica and from there, like off, off to Trinidad and that trip was over. It was then in 2017 when I went, like, obviously, and once I knew that I was going to West Indies for uh, just a one day series that India was playing there, 
Jamaica was on the cards. Like, you know, you know how it is. Like, I knew I'm going to Jamaica. I was, by then, you know, you become obsessive, right? Like, you're like, mm. how can I not find this guy? Like, so I kept thinking about it. And then it was just like the most amazing set of circumstances that led me to like find him. Like some fascinating characters who played like they're like, you know, significant roles in helping me get there. I want to just stop there and talk about the journalist side of this. You were with the Indian Express at the time, right? Yeah. Generally, what stops journalists doing stuff like this, sports journalists, is the sort of daily grind of having to find another article. One of the reasons I get to write these sorts of things is I don't have to go to press conferences and don't have to do the proper cricket journalism that the rest of you guys have to do. So I can just swan off and see if I can find someone and that sort of thing. Whereas you don't have that available to you. Are you telling your editors at this stage that you're following the story or are you just sort of doing it on your days off? Not really days off, but kind of almost days off. Yeah, when you write for a newspaper, there are no days off. And especially when your company spent a lot of money to send you all the way mm. there. They like, you know, they you ex, you're expected to fill up a whole page. And you know, the Indian Express, uh, my former employers, they had high standards for good reason. And like, you know, they expected really high quality work. And I was technically there covering the Indian team. And you know, a lot had happened in the lead up to it because that's when the whole Virat Kohli Anil Kumble thing had broken and India had gone on that tour without a coach and like, you know, so my company had sent me there not to find Patrick Patterson, but to actually crack the Virat Kohli, Anil Kumble story. So I was working on that as well, like, you know, speaking to players, getting their views. So then I was moonlighting really once I reached Jamaica in trying to find him. So my editor obviously knew that I was obsessed with this guy and he knew that I would go after him. But at the same time, like, it was funny because it was just a tour where I kept finding a lot of former West Indies fast bowlers. Winston Benjamin, I told you, Franklin Rose couple of others who I didn't write on, but it was just one of those crazy, almost meant to be things. And I had to ensure that the page was getting filled. I was writing two stories a day. But I think in a way, the time difference helped because I had the whole afternoon because mm. my deadline would be like 2 p.m. Jamaica time. And after that, I had the whole day to myself. So once I knew what I was going to write the next day, I had him in my sights. But it, the whole thing fell into place from the moment I landed in Kingston because that was the last leg of the tour. And I just found this really random place on Booking.com or one of those places on some, just one of those things. I like to stay really far away from the ground. and You just get to see so much more of the country. Mm. And like, it was just this random, like, you know, lodge on the hill. And the guy who ran it was this very interesting guy called Courtney. And he messaged me, emailed me saying, I'll pick you up from the airport. And like, you know, he picked me up. He was a half American, half Jamaican guy. And like, you know, he, he had this wonderful old Jeep. And he's driving me on, like, you know, the streets of Kingston. And he's like, oh, then he told me, oh, you know, there's this old guy who, like, lives with us. He keeps talking about cricket. So he might know about this Patrick Patterson guy. And my first instinct, obviously, right, our journalistic instinct again is like, oh, what if it is him? Old man who can't move. Okay, everything is falling into place. So I got really excited. And mm. then he drives me up to his lodge. And there's, like, a room at the back. And I'm like, forget about my luggage. Take me to him. And we go there and like hear a voice from inside. And then Courtney is like, you know, hey, 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 man, like some boy standing here. He wants to meet Patrick Patterson. And, and I hear a voice from inside saying, oh, Patrick, you here? You here, boy? And I'm like, oh, God, like, no, <laughs> it's some just some really old guy suffering from dementia who thought I was Patrick Patterson. So my shoulders like, you know, slouched. I just went to a corner and like, you know, lit a cigarette back when I used to smoke. Now I'm clean, Jared. But like, you know, and... Courtney sat with me and he was like, who is this guy? What are you so obsessed about him? And I told him the whole story. And he's like, do you really want me to help you? I'm like, yeah, as if you're going to help me. He's like, no, I will use my RIA contacts and I'll try to get something for you. And I was like, what the hell is RIA? He's like, Rastafarian Intelligence Agency. <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? He's like, don't worry about it. I'll do something for you. Then, like you said, daily grind begins. I go to the ground, do my daily bit, start writing. The next day or two days later, I get a call from Courtney. He's like, okay, I might have something for you. Like, meet me here and there. Like, and it was like I was suddenly part of a movie. I remember I was at some bar writing and then he picks me up and he's like, I found your man. And I'm like, ah, oh, bullshit. He's like, no, I found your man. I'm like, okay. And he's like, we're going to him. I said, what do you mean? I don't even know what state he's in. He said, I don't know. I don't care. We're going to his place. So he drives me to this house and he's like, that's his house. And I'm like, what are we doing now? He's like, I don't know. You're the journalist. <laughs> so, and he had a phone number. I was like, I can't just go in. He just gives me a phone number. I call him. I didn't know what to expect. And then like three or four rings later, I hear this voice saying, 
uh, hello, sir. And I'm like, is this Mr. Patterson? He's like, yes, it is. And I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, and, you know, I didn't expect him to sound so normal after all these things <laughs> that I'd heard. And like I said, oh, my name is Bharat. I'm a journalist. He's like, oh, okay, okay. I am here to write on cricket. I wanted to meet you. He's like, oh, no, no, no. I don't remember anything about that. You know, I'd been off all that for a long time. I, in fact, hear women play cricket these days. I didn't even know that. I'm like, what? Like, yeah, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm this big fan of yours. I have to meet you. I was being honest, really. Forget about the interview. I was just like, I just wanted to meet him. Yeah, after all that time, especially. Yeah, right? At that point, he's like, ah, oh, no, give me some time. I don't know. I don't know. And then suddenly he's like, maybe I should meet you. Maybe it'll fix all the problems in my life. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can you like call me tomorrow? I'll think about it. And I'm like, excited. Problem was, Courtney, who had been in the American military, and he thought it was he was on a mission because he's like, what is he saying? And I'm like, no, he doesn't want to meet me now. He's like, I don't care. I'm going to smoke him out. And I said, what? <laughs> he's like, I'm going to smoke him out. And then it turned out that Courtney had grown up in that suburb. And then he just like drove around, went to the cops. Like he just wanted to know what's happening in that house. They didn't know anything. He went to the like local chapel to find out if they knew. They didn't know. And then I meet the second set of really fascinating characters in this story. So the RIA, which is basically his friends, this guy called Fred Locks, you should look him up. This legendary reggae musician, like he was in his like 60s and like this jolly, paunchy guy, like, you know, who this massive dreadlocks. I'm just going to cut into Barrett here. So he's the voice of God coming in to talk to you. This is just a short little song of Fred Locks. So you get an idea of what kind of a musician he was. Uh, we'll also put a link up to Fred Locks in the show notes. And so Courtney takes me to his house. So it's him, his brother, Scary, who had these really scary eyes, and their <laughs> sister. And like they had dreadlocks, like they were like some 10 meters long. <laughs> and I think to myself, am I in Wonderland? What's happening here? And I just spent the whole like evening, night there talking about Rastafarianism with these guys. And then the brother, Scary, tells me, ah, uh, yeah, like, you know, your man, Patrick, used to buy a lot of ganja from me. He'd been doing that for uh, the last 20 years. I'm like, oh, okay. And that's how we know him. And like, yeah. And then they literally grown up with each other. Mm. And like, you know, I, I like Fred Logs, that doesn't even sound like a real name. Look him up and like, you know, he's pretty famous. Like lots of pictures of him. His albums are out there on Spotify, <laughs> everywhere. Anyway, so that was the first night. And then the next day, I called my editor. I'm like, I found him. And he's like, did you meet him? And I was like, no, I haven't. But I found him and he's like, <laughs> like, you know, he was really amazed. Like, we all, like, you know, I'd been telling him, like, irritating him about it for so many years. Like, in every West Indies tour, I was like, I need to go, I need to go, I need to go find this guy. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> so, I think there were a couple of toes in between. He didn't send me just because he didn't want to hear the name Patrick Patterson <laughs> from me. So, anyway, so the next day, there was the one day or I think, and I was at Sabina Park and hardly focusing on the game. And I call him like at noon and like I start talking to him. He's like, uh, so I'm like, what time do you want me to come? And suddenly he says, oh, no, 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 no. I've been thinking about you. Believe you me, like I can't meet you today. I can't meet you because you don't know I'm in no state to meet anyone. I have no home. I have no state to meet. And I'm like, well, what happened all of a sudden? Like you were fine. And he just went on this whole rant about how you couldn't meet me. And then I don't know what happened to me, Jared. I really got angry. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> and I just told him, like I said, look, Mr. Patterson. Okay, don't meet me today, but someday meet someone, tell them your real story. Because till the time you do that, 
people will keep calling you a crazy guy. People will still think that you are in a loony bin because that's the only reality people know. That's what they're mm. saying outside. So do that. Like, you know, forget about me. And like, he's like, no, 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 don't get upset. And then like from nowhere, he just asked me what the score was. And I was like, I don't know, I think West Indies were batting. I took a couple of names. He's like, who are they? Who plays for West Indies these days? I was like, oh, okay. So I said, what last do you remember? He's like, ah, uh, well, I'm sure Brian doesn't play anymore, does he? I said, no, no, it's been a while. So I just told him like, you know, about the scores. And he's like, I'm so sorry, but like, you know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I shouldn't like, and I don't know, Jared, like I was heartbroken, right? Like, mm. you know, you're there, you have it, like story is right there because two things go through your head. Was I making a big deal about this all along? Like, you know, was it that easily accessible and I just didn't get him? Or mm. is this like the end of the road? And, you know, I just spent the rest of the day watching the game. And then like something just told me like that evening, I should just call him, just try one last time. So I just called him and I said, oh, do you know, Mr. Patterson, West Indies won today. Like, you know, he's like, oh, that's really good to know. Like, what happened? And I just told him. And I said, oh, this Virat Kohli is Indian. He's like, I've heard that name. They say he bats like Tendulkar. I remember bowling to Tendulkar. But the guy I really feared was Chris Shrikant. And I'm like, hmm. oh, okay. So, like, you know, your memory is not that bad. And then he's like, you know what? Come and meet me today. Because something about you tells me I need to meet you. And because I told him about how I'd met his parents. He's like... If you went all the way to meet my parents, some, there must be something. Like, just meet me. And I'm like, shit, this is it, right? And then I just hail a cab and I called Courtney because he wanted to come as well. He's like, oh, I want to come, but I, he was somewhere else. So, you know, this was getting all very exciting. And then, like, I go there and Jared, I didn't know what to expect because he had said he's not in a great state. Was he going to come out in a wheelchair? Was he going to walk out? Was he going to crawl out? I had no idea. Mm. So there I, I am standing outside his gate. And he just walks out and like, that's the picture we use in the story. He just walks out and like, you know, he's tall and he, he wasn't as big as he used to be, but seemed nothing wrong with him really on the face of it. And he just walks out and he's like, hello, sir. Like, and we start talking and he's like, there used to be this bar by the river somewhere, like, you know, close by. Can we go there? I used to go there a lot. And like, you know, I'm like, yeah, sure. So we go there. And the funny thing was like, as we were walking in, there was this board outside which said like, no drugs allowed. And he just looks at it, points at it, and he says, you know, there's one of the main reasons I couldn't come here was that. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. It's awkward to then ask anyone about any more details, right? So I'm like, okay, fine. So then we sit by the river, and that's when I shot a little video of him. And we start talking, and I start telling him about all these things that I know about him. And he just keeps looking at me blankly, and he's like, I wish I remembered all of that, but I really don't remember any of that. And then I felt a little awkward. So it was just like a five minute video that I switched it off. And the funny thing is while I'm recording him on my phone, he's like, I didn't know phones can like do all that. How can you take pictures with your phone? Like he had no idea. He had this really old Nokia phone, which I think he's had for the last 18 years. It was like talking to someone who has been in some coma for 30 years, mm. seriously. Then we start talking and then I start asking him about like detailed stuff about going to Australia and England. And then it was just like a lot of random memories about some really weird things. Like, you know, if we'd be talking and I would tell him, oh, I remember this spell you bowled, you were very famous for that. And Graham Gooch was scared of you. And he was like, oh, no, no, no. And then from nowhere, I would be like, by the way, didn't your prime minister just go to Vietnam or something like that? I'm like, yeah, how do you know that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I watched on the news. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it was really random. And then we spoke and we spoke and we spoke. And then he started telling me about how this whole like almost, I wouldn't call it schizophrenia, but like this expression just started changing after like half an hour, 45 minutes or so. And he said, okay, I don't think you should meet me again. I said, what happened? He's like, no, no, no. Whoever meets me, bad things happen to them. They will get you. And I'm like, who's they? He's like, they will get you. Trust me, whoever has been close to me, they have got to them. They're coming for me all the time. And I'm like, what is he talking about? And part of me was a little scared because, you know, you're like in far away Kingston. And when someone's telling you all this and nobody's met him for 25 years, like, uh, okay, <laughs> what do I say now? I'm not a trained psychologist, but I don't know. I found this like deep inner meaning within myself, Jared, like you wouldn't recognize it seriously. <laughs> and I started talking to him like I was his shrink. I was like, Mr. Patterson, those people don't exist. There is no they. It's just you and me. Whatever you're talking about, it doesn't exist. I gave him this wild rant about like, you know, we won't talk about them. And after that, suddenly like more and more like, you know, memories started coming to him. He started telling me about Viv Richards like got pissed off with him on his last tour in 1991. 
he hit him in the glove and Viv Richards just threw his back and went away. Then he spoke about how he had a bad time in Tasmania. People didn't treat him too well. And then in Lancashire, when he said Wasim Akram and him were like playing for them together or like maybe one replaced the other. And he's like, Wasim Akram had this fancy house on the hill. I was in like, I was sharing a bunker with someone, like, you know, some people I met, some girl I met somewhere and nobody treated me well. And like, it was just one of those rants about how he'd been never been given his due or always ill-treated. And then he got excommunicated. Then he told me how he's printed in bold letters, injustice on his wall. And uh, he just keeps looking at it. And I kept telling him, oh, first thing you should go, go home today, wipe it off the wall. And he never let me inside his house. Like that was one thing. Then the night ended with like, you know, then he's like, how did you get to me? And then I tell him this crazy story. And he's like, do you know Fred Locks? I'm like, yeah, I do. And he's like, oh, I'm a huge fan of his. Like, you know, I'm like, what? He lives like three streets away. You didn't know he lives there? He's like, I had no idea. And I'm like, hang on. Like, you know, so then I call Courtney and then he's like, okay, we need the two to meet. That night, like in the cab were Courtney Fred Locks, Patrick Madison, and me. And I'm like, this is really surreal, right? <laughs> and obviously, like, he's a big guy. He could hardly fit in the cab. And I, I was in the front seat. I was, like, literally smashed against the dashboard. <laughs> like, you know. So, Patrick Patterson is having this fanboy moment with Fred Locks in the back seat. And, like, he's like, I remember this song, that album. And, like, you know, Fred Locks is telling him about his cricket, which obviously he doesn't remember. That night, I just went to my room and I didn't know what to do. I was sl- slightly emotional, Jared. You know me. I don't Hmm. get emotional. I'm just like this, like you, you and I are the same. But (laughs) something happened to me that night. I was like, wow, like, you know, it honestly didn't feel like some great story that I found. I'm like, he's my responsibility from now on. Like, I have to be his window to the world, really. So I think three or four days left on that tour. I would call him day and night, ask him what he was up to, like, you know, give him all this shrink advice about wipe the injustice off, nothing's happening to you. And like certain things started coming back to him about his cricket, about his life. And then he would slip into the whole, please be careful, they're going to come for you. And then I had to calm him down. And I was like, one part of me was going, I hope they don't come for me, whatever they is, before I reach Bombay. But nobody did. And then I realized what the whole issue was. It was basically this whole, whatever happened to him, maybe it was drugs, maybe it was just like, he was lost in, in his own world. But I think he told me that he heard this radio like show when in the mid-90s sometime, when there was this discussion about what happened to him. And apparently they said that he is in the loony bin or he should be in the loony bin. So mm. it's almost like he lives in fear that if someone else sees him, they'll just put him in the loony bin. And like, you know, I think and my theory really based on all that I saw and all that I met. And then I met him like a few more times. Like, and I would start telling him about what's happening in the cricket and what the IPL is and like, you know, all those random things. I met him maybe two more times, like for... A few beers, I've like, you know, bought him fish. And like, I asked him, like, where he gets money from. And he apparently has two kids who live in Canada. And now they don't come and visit him anymore, but they used to. And they used to send some money and some basic stuff for him. And he has like a TV at home, like, which I think shows random news, which that's his only other window into the world except me. That's how it really panned out. And then I remember going, it was almost like this weird romantic story, like where even before boarding my flight, I had to go say bye to him. Like, you know, So I went to his place, spent like 15, 20 minutes. And then we took I, I my only selfie with a cricketer, which is, I was like, oh, well, I think this moment deserves a photo. <laughs> like, you know, and he was amazed that a camera could turn both ways. And like, yeah, it was just one of those really crazy things. And then came the big challenge of like, how do you write a story like this, right? Like, I mean, it can't be like, oh, there's this guy and you fought, like, you know, so... It's not very natural for you when you write for a newspaper to bring yourself into the story, right? Like Mm. I and like you stuff like make yourself a part of the story. But then I spoke to my boss and then like we both decided that the only way the story would like work is if I do that. Like, you know, if basically I write about this whole journey in finding him and not just about what he's doing now and what state he's in like because you had to give like the whole like talk about this guy who's really not a hundred percent. And it's sad, but at the same time, it's maybe it's of his own doing to an extent. So it was just a very difficult story to write. And it took me like two or three days. And then from Jamaica, I went to Virginia where my brother lives. And like I spent like two, three days with him babysitting his son and like trying my level best to like, you know, push him away and write my story. And that's Hmm. how it came about, Jared. 
and it's quite weird because it's not a sort of article the Indian Express would normally do, and I don't think there was another way of telling it. And realistically, it's not that he's the first player from the West Indies to disappear at the end of their career, and he's not the first one to fall on hard times. There's been far worse. There have been West Indies players who have ended up as prostitutes. There have been ones that have had drug overdoses. There's been ones that have gone to prison. You know, there's some horrendous stories out there, but it's something to do with the fact that he disappeared for such a long time. A lot of those other guys, you sometimes you just bump into them in rum shacks. And like Richard and, Austin, yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're kind of around or they're at the ground and... The whole thing is just so fascinating. How did you feel? Because, I mean, you're not an expert on psychology. You know, he doesn't have an official diagnosis. I'm sure he's probably never been to a counsellor. How did you handle that side of things? Like, if you wrote it now, would you write it slightly differently than you did at the time? I don't think so, you know. Like, so I didn't want to get, while writing it, like, I didn't want to get into too much of, like, why he's saying all these things. Because I don't know, right? Like, I mean, my theory, like I said, is maybe fear and schizophrenia and the drugs don't help if you've done it for so long. He's clean now. I mean, from what I saw, has a odd beer or two. But, like, you know, I've seen people, like, my wife, she's a special needs teacher. So I've from her over the years, I've heard a lot about, like, mental health issues and, like, how there's so much out there that we don't know about. And, like, you know, I grew up with... I was in a heavy metal phase in my life and I saw a lot of people like do a lot of drugs and a lot of crazy things happen to them. Like, you know, people really like change. And so, I mean, I had a very basic understanding of it, but here's a guy who's dealt with it all alone, like, you know, with nobody Mm. and with nothing but just this. So that's where I divided it between like, you know, into like the story, like the one, the article and then my relationship with him for, I guess, the rest of our lives, because it still continues, mm. where I said, like, I owe it to him in, in a way, like, you know, he's my responsibility. Now that I've made all this effort to find him, like, I need to make sure he's okay or, like, make sure he feels like he has someone. So yeah, I had to, like, literally divorce the two things, if if that makes sense, to. So, like, even in my article, I brought a little bit about it. Like, I did write about how he thinks that someone will get me and he fears for me or, like, he fears for anyone who meets him. Like, Mm. just to explain the state he's in. But I don't think I wanted to dig well too much into it because, like you said, like, I'm no expert. I don't know. Like, you know, someone actually asked me, should you have, like, approached, like, a psych or someone who with a... But that, Mm. that wasn't the real story. Like, funnily enough, like, a lot of psychologists wrote to me after, like, the article appeared coming up with their own diagnosis and prognosis based on just my story. Oh, he must be going through this and that. Like, you know, it was fascinating to read about this guy. Like even people who did not know him, Facebook and a lot of other places, a lot of people wrote to me about their theories on like experts, like doctors. So yeah, he's just a fascinating case, I guess, for people who are interested in all that. And let's talk about the cricket a little bit. It kind of starts with him being essentially the fastest West Indian bowler of that era. And certainly maybe the fastest consistently. He was someone who almost every ball came in. He had the, I'm trying to think, is it Roy Gilchrist who had the big foot up in the air? He had the big Roy Gilchrist. So you could see the spikes. And if you're too young, if you're younger than me and Barra and you've never seen it, it's worth going back and having a look at photos of Roy Gilchrist and Patrick Patterson. Marchant DeLang was probably the last guy I saw in international cricket to do it. It's almost like they're pointing the bottom of their foot at you. I mean, he was such a striking visual force, but he was also a very talented bowler. He took 90 wickets at 30 in test cricket, and he did that while not being the attacking bowler. Like When they needed to attack, they usually went to their frontline bowlers. His job was to do the sort of grunt work in the middle, sort of what Neil Wagner does, I suppose. Yeah, you're so right. Like, you know, people often think, that like just because he was the fastest bowler, he was their strike bowler. But he bowled long spells, actually. He was this fit guy. They used to call him Rambo. And like one of the first famous stories about him in the West Indian circles is apparently you would have heard about when Jamaica and Barbados used to play each other in the domestic competition mm. back in the 70s and 80s. It used to be a big deal. And apparently there was young Patrick Patterson. I think Mikey Holding was playing that game. And Gordon Greenwich and Desmond Haynes opening the batting. And... Apparently, he was bowled this incredibly quick over to Gordon Greenwich, where one ball hit Gordon Greenwich on the chest. And apparently, Gordon Greenwich always used to have starch his shirt. It was all white. And like people say, they could see the starch fly off mm. the shirt. Like, you know, people who were watching that game from the stands. And like, uh, apparently, he rattled Gordon Greenwich. He was that quick. So it was the pace that brought him into the equation. 
But like you'll had like way more skillful bowlers like Curtly Ambrose's and like you know when Winston Benjamin started around the same time, and Courtney Walsh was around like you know and maybe towards the latter half Ian Bishop came along. So he was in the mix, but he was never like their number one bowler or. But mm. they used him like that, like you know, he was the workhorse more than which he speaks about, like you know, whenever he's lucid enough, like about how he says he claims that he he believes that he wasn't used the way he should have been used. Yeah, I think that's fair. Thinking back to it, I always thought that he was a far better bowler. Like when, when I looked it up, and he only had an average of thirty. That's not the bowler that I remember because he was. If you used him correctly, you could almost use him the way that Pat Cummins has been used as a first change bowler because he, he didn't move the ball massively sideways. No, but uh, Shannon Gabriel and Pat Cummins are probably very good examples of they can bowl slightly longer spells because they're consistently quick and they can move it away. Whereas it felt like the West Indies just went, well, he's number four, so we'll work him into the ground and make sure that obviously Courtney Walsh is a similar bowler and then they would attack from the other end yeah and it felt like that was his sort of wanton life but i remember him almost ripping alan border's nipple off a couple of times your piece talks about him getting javid mean that out i mean he was absolutely top quality as a bowler even if you just look at 90 wickets at 30 that is an incredible record to begin with for the fact that what happened at the end of his career, you talk about him playing cricket in England and not being treated correctly and playing cricket in the Tasmania and not being treated correctly, but also he finished his West Indies career and basically vanished, didn't he? I mean, he was, what, 30, 31? And he disappeared. He was, yeah. Being dropped after that 92 World Cup from the Australia Tour, he just disappeared. Like, you know, he never recovered from it. And Courtney Walsh and him, like, grew up together. They went to the same school together. They played under-19 cricket together. So they were very close when they came into the picture. And... I think Walsh started playing very, like, you know, two or three years before Patrick Patterson did. But, see, from what I've heard also, like, I've spoken to other West Indians, maybe he was a bit too sensitive for such a big guy. And he never could take any kind of setback, like being dropped in help. So he, he told me, like, I remember one, one night when, during that trip, that when he went to England, he thought that he was not at his quickest. So he started working on off cutters and leg cutters, and he felt really confident with it. And he started trying it out in the nets and he wasn't very happy with what he saw. And the team management were like, well, that's not what you're here for. Like, you know, you're supposed to bowl fast and you're supposed to be terrifying. And he was like, well, I was, I'm was, i just adding to my skills. I want to take wickets. But they were like, yeah, no. And that's when, like, you know, he bowls this quick ball with Richards on his last tour of England. Like, you know, he loses grip of his bat because it hits like the top of the bat and is quick. And apparently, like, allegedly, like, Richards just flung his bat against the net and walked away in disgust because he didn't like what had happened to him. So it's funny, like, that era, right? Like, just after the the Big Four, when the Ambrose and Walsh and those guys were coming in, there are some guys, even Winston Benjamin, for example, wasn't happy with the way he was treated. It's a great copy for someday. Like, we hear so much about the harmony in that team when Lloyd was captain. But you hear of, of like a lot of friction towards the late 80s, like a lot of people not getting on with each other. And Patterson just wasn't, he didn't have the personality maybe to survive in that environment, like is what came through from all my conversations with him. And even now when he remembers things about people and like, you know, his times, that's what comes through. The whole thing's quite interesting. I mean, the one thing I was hit with, we know that professionalism wasn't at its top back when he played, but he did actually play as a professional cricketer in three countries. He played test cricket. He was a cricketer that everyone knew. He might not have been always an automatic inclusion in the team. Everyone knew who he was. So he's a big name. He's a professional, but the absolute dire treatment that he gets, whether it be in Lancashire or Tasmania or with the West Indies, it really does show that in one way or another, he's a very, I think he's a lost person to West Indies cricket because he never got a chance to work with any other young bowlers. He was never involved to pass on any of his knowledge. He also, because he didn't speak up about what happened publicly, yeah. there was no way of sort of fixing that as well. And so it felt like to me that cricket had let him down and perhaps he was just at the wrong era. Maybe even five years later, there would have been structures in place. But just that particular time in that place, he was completely just let down by what cricket was. Absolutely. Like, you're so right. Like, maybe if his career just, like, extended to the mid-90s, 96, 97, he might have come through because I've heard that some people like in the Caribbean did or in Jamaica did try to like kind of get in touch with him in the late 90s, like to see if he could come back and like work. But I've heard like both sides of the story. Like they claim like the Great West Indies guys claim he never showed up or he showed up one day for a 
bowling camp and then just disappeared but he says like he never got invited so you know mm-hmm. who knows like you know who's speaking the truth because it was also a time when he was actually going through a lot like you know mentally so like yeah we will never know the truth but there are so many cases like that of cricketers in the west indies and and the most fascinating thing for me was like when the my article came out and like a lot of people spoke about it people in the caribbean like i remember courtney walsh tweeting about it or something and my first thing was oh finally finally now that it's out there someone's going to reach out to him help him like you know do something for him like but then like here we are like nearly 3 years later and he's still left on his own like he's he still has nobody like yeah it's strange and then you you wonder why like mm. like what what could be the reason like but also i mean i would also say that he is also in a place where he's so apprehensive he's so scared of people that mm. even if someone like you know reached out to him with help i don't know whether he would be is in a position to accept any of it the west indies thing is really interesting to me because i've obviously through cricket spent a lot of time with the west indies i'm also very fascinated with kenya basically through my piece on Asif Kareem, who was a lot easier to find, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> he still WhatsApps me all the time. And he knows what WhatsApp is. So he's hugely in advance of Patrick Patterson. But one thing he said to me was, like in Kenya, we had so many great athletes that we basically we don't know how to keep them and treat them. And if you look at the West Indies, especially a place like Jamaica, which now doesn't even just have great cricketers anymore, but also has great other athletes, And there seems to be this real failure to look after them at the next level. And you and I know that, I say this all the time, but LinkedIn, go to LinkedIn and look up former cricketers. It's just a graveyard of businesses they've tried to do, jobs that haven't stuck. And it's not like these people are dumb or unable, but they haven't worked in a real environment, a lot of them, for 15, 20 years. And then suddenly they're thrown in and and it doesn't work. And the West Indies, I think the three main ones that you notice this the most are, are, you know, Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica, because they've all produced so many cricketers, and that's almost what they're known for, and so many incredible athletes in in different places. It's almost like they can't keep hold of every one of them. And, you know, you will go into a rum shop or somewhere, and they'll just point, and they'll go, you know, that guy. And then you you look over, and it's like, wait a minute, that's a guy who played 40 tests, or that's a guy, you know, an, an incredible cricketer. And there's almost no way to keep all these people in such a small environment, you have to understand that the ratio of human to star in those places is not like anywhere else, is it? It really is not. It was the same with Winston Benjamin. Like, you know, so I was told that in Antigua, he's in charge of putting up the boundary boards around the ad once, like around the ground. So I assumed he must be the boss. He must be running the business. So I got his contact. I called him. He's like, yeah, I'm at the ground now. So, so this is like day before the game. And I go there and like, he was one of the guys like, you know, putting the boards up and, I was a little taken aback. And obviously, like you and I know, most of these in-stadia rights in that part of the world are owned by Indians. And there were these two Indian fellows there who were like, you know, in charge of the whole thing. And then like, you know, they saw Winston just have like a couple of words with me and they had no idea who he was. They, then they came around and like blasted him. They were like, you can't be talking on your job. Like, you know, please. Mm-hmm. And he, they looked at me and said, can you please let him do his job? And like, and I felt really bad. As, and he was like, no, nah, man, that's all right. That's all right. That's when he said like an honest pay for an honest day. And then he went back to doing his bit. And I walked up to the two Indian guys. I said like, do you guys know who he is? He's like, I don't know. He's just like one of the guys who should be doing his work, but he's not. And I was like, no, no, he's Winston Benjamin. He took 100 wickets. And they like, Oh, really? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And then they went and like, you know, they kind of apologized to him. And like, he wasn't too chuffed about it. He told me later, like, it doesn't matter. Like, this is not India. Like, you know, it's fine. Like, I need a job. And this is the only thing I can do right now. So this is what I'm doing. Look, so it's just a different world out there. Those who make it and those who don't. Like I said, in Jamaica, those who make it live on the ill, right? Like whether even Nehemiah Perry, like, you know, played what, like 15 test matches? He lives on the ill. Because he made it, like he made the right decisions in life. I mean, it's the same with the whole Stanford thing as well, right? So many people like, you know, invested that money in Stanford and lost everything. But there were like a couple of smart guys who did not and they still have the money. So it's just a very, very different part of the world where if you don't make it, you either make sure you're intelligent, you have like some background or some backing. Or if not, like, yeah, this it's very difficult because... Like you said, they've not done a proper job. And it's not like in India yeah. where you can, just because you played cricket, you, you'll you get a job. You're not in a first world country where like you can do anything like Chatfield, drive a taxi or like Chris Old go and run a supermarket. And like, you know, it's fine. Like, you know, even if you're not doing great in life. But 
over there, you don't make it, you don't make it. Like, you know, and that's a classic case. He's just a classic case of that. And like, no, and before I go, seriously, the thing is like, now, you know, what, how I try and get his memory going. I just call him and, I, and it costs me a lot. Unfortunately, your guy at least can use WhatsApp. My guy can't. So I have to call him. <laughs> <laughs> and cost me a lot of dollars. And I just read out scorecards from Cricket Archive. And each time I read a name out and he gets these memories and starts telling me stuff about like this and that. And I, I just put a smile on my face, really. <laughs> Nothing more. To finish there is perfect because that's kind of what he did to us. Like watching him play, you couldn't watch Patrick Patterson and not have a smile on your face. He was an incredibly fast, ferocious bowler. And that's why we remember him. And that's why you spent most of your life chasing him. <laughs> there you go and I found him and I'll, like you said I'm putting a smile on his face thank you for listening you can follow my guest on Twitter at BeastieBoy07 because of course that is his handle which I'll put a link to in the show notes in case that's hard for you to work out I also Twitter and I have a YouTube channel so I'll put those links also Please review this podcast on Apple or anywhere or everywhere, really. Uh, These things actually help us. I don't know how or why, but I'm told they do. This podcast is made possible by those people who support us on Patreon, and they get to hear the episode first. So in many ways, they're the real winners here. Red Inca is made by me, Jared Kimber. Nick McCorriston touches things, and the theme tune is by the Red Crickets. 